Good morning. Um, I'm going to continue the talks about the um, ox herding pictures to today's stage nine, which is called uh, returning to the source or returning to the ground or the origin. Um, and uh, this picture just, uh, I don't know, that's supposed to represent it. It, it shows a, um, it looks like a willow tree, <laughs> maybe next to a pond or something like that. I don't know. Um, I'm just going to, uh, my talk mostly is just going to uh, be to reiterate some of the commentaries on this, on this uh, particular stage, you know, um, and a few of my own comments. But um, the preface uh, to this, uh, to this stage, if you remember, the, the last, the last stage was that the, uh, the herds, herdsman or herds person forgot the self and also forgot the ox, which is, represents the true self. It was just uh, totally in a state of non-attachment to anything. And, uh, and in this stage, um, it's exemplified by the uh, Taoist phrase of uh, non-doing, you know, which means by not, they don't have, there's no need to effort or exert oneself. Everything gets done, but it's non-doing. It's not trying to accomplish something. It's just a natural state. And uh, in this stage, <clears throat> one contemplates the impermanence uh, and sees it uh, flourishing and withering and, and dwells in the collective quietness of non-doing. Um, she does not allow herself to be tricked by the transitory and uh, deceptive images of the world and does not stand in need of any further training. And so, um, even though uh, from the beginning there's, there's no dust, there's nothing to attach to, still blue flows the streams and green rises the mountains <coughs> and red blooms the flowers. So, okay. so <clears throat> before we're um, awakened, uh, there's a famous Chinese poem. It says mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. But when we're suddenly awakened by training with a master who has insight, the mountains are not mountains and rivers are not rivers. I mean, that's a state of awakening where everything drops away. We, there's no differentiation at all. You know, it's just a, a state of awakening. And then if we go further along the way um, and, and succeed in realizing this uh, state of ground or source, then the mountain is a mountain, the river is a river. <laughs> So what's the difference? Um, <coughs> so in um, in the the Wayan, a book called Wayan, there's a chapter about a Zen master named Taimi. He says, "Dear students, turn your heart around and enter the origin. Do not search." For those that have sprung out of it, when you have gained the origin, what has sprung out of it will come to you of itself. If you want to know the origin, then penetrate your own original heart. This heart is the source of all beings in the world and outside it as well. When the heart stirs, various beings arise, and when the heart itself becomes completely empty, the various beings also become empty. If your heart is driven by neither good nor bad, then all things are just as they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So we always want to add some quali qualifier or quantifier to things, you know? Um, I remember back, I think it was in the 1970s, they had this very, there was this very popular self-realization course called EST, called Earhart Seminar Training is what it stood for. And uh, I was living at the Zen Center in Los Angeles and uh, a number of people were taking this because they thought that it helped clarify some things. And so there was, here's a, there was a final examination in the course to see whether you got what they were teaching. And uh, you would uh, stand in front of the trainer and he would say, here's a chocolate ice cream cone and here's a vanilla ice cream cone. Do you know this one? No? <laughs> and they would say, you'd say, choose one. And so you'd choose the uh, vanilla ice cream cone. And then he would say, well, why did you choose the vanilla ice cream cone? And there's only one answer they would accept. Do you know what that answer is? You say, well, I like vanilla. No, that's not, <laughs> no, that's, that's not it. I hate chocolate. No, no, <laughs> that's not it. Um, I don't know. I, I just felt, I felt like it, you know. And so finally, you have to say, I chose vanilla because I chose vanilla. That's the only answer that they would accept. Because we have all of these projections and these ideas of things. And it says here, if your heart is not driven by good or bad, then all beings are just as they are. It's just as it is. I chose vanilla. Okay. Now, why did you bury that person? <laughs> <laughs> because I married that person. Yeah. <laughs> she has a nice personality. She, uh, no, you married that person because you married that person. You know, we have all of these these rationalities about things. You know, and uh, I've talked about this many times, but I. I contend, this is my opinion, <laughs> that nobody has ever in their life made a rational decision. <laughs> okay? We might think that we do. Okay? And it's something simple. I have to buy a new computer. Okay? And I look at the, you know, there's a Dell and there's a Hewlett Packard and they have these features and these prices and, and I'm going to be using it. Mostly for word processing and maybe some spreadsheets and occasionally I'm going to watch a video, you know, but I don't, I don't, I'm not a video gamer, so I don't need all of this memory and high speed video uh, processors. And so, all right, it's be, come down between the Hewlett Packard and the Dell. I'm going to take the Dell. And you go and you buy it. Okay, what happened between the moment you were deciding and the moment that you picked the dough? Do you think that was a rational thing? No, it was an intuitive leap of faith. And you, that's not, you know, the way that your mind works. You think, oh man, you know, I really researched this. But no, suddenly you're undecided, and the next moment you're decided. You just leapt into the chasm yeah and i think that's with everything i don't think we ever uh, make what i would call a rational decision there always is some intuitive leap there where we trust ourselves and in this stage there's really a lot of trust because the student has gone through the ringer of training Maybe you don't know about ring or some of you young people. <laughs> but my mother had one of these old fashioned washing machines, and after they wash it, you'd take the clothes and you'd run them between these two 
cylinders of wood with a crank and squeeze all the water out of it and then, then she'd flush one up and put it on the clothesline. But you've gone through all of the the fires and the trials of training and you reached a point what we call the great yes. You know, where everything has been released, but you say yes to everything. Yes to life. Yes to emptiness. Yes to all beings. Only here, everything is absolutely affirmed. And here, the nature is in. It comes in accord with every circumstance. So um, one commentary says that in the eighth stage, where the, the nature of self and others is unity, you know, they're, they're, everything's forgotten, it's all one. But in this ninth stage concerns the presence of things, which is diversity. Um, and um, so this is turning the absolute no, which is emptiness, into the um, absolute yes, which where you see everything in its original nature, but at the same time, you realize everywhere you look, you see your own face, and you see the face of Buddha as well. So the unhindered life of Zen, which is originally pure and without dust, circulates everywhere. And the Zen life is in each person. It lives in all, from the Buddha to all beings. And it's not greater for being in the Buddha, and it's not lesser for being in all beings. So our world in which the Green Mountain really is the Green Mountain, and the Blue River is really the Blue River, is nothing other than the presence of our original nature. So from the beginning, you know, before even the world arose, all ordained people and lay people and cats and dogs and spoons and forks and grass and river and all countries and all beings have been Buddha. And one who has realized this stage is called a person of no form. He says a great yes to the real world precisely in its reality. So there's great peace, joy, and freedom reigning. But everything's subject to change. It's all transient. That's one of the main teachings of the Buddha, that everything is impermanent. Everything's transient. You know, we rise and thrive, and then we dwindle and fade away. So we stand in the middle of the chaotic world, but at the same time, we don't turn away from our original self, from this origin. So we're no longer separate from our original home, even when we're busily engaged. even in all kinds of relationships. There's an expression that one in this stage acts at the same time does not act, and does not act and at the same time acts. And that's why it's called non-doing. You know, at the end of the Diamond Sutra, it talks about this life 
is transient life. It says it's like a dream, an illusion, a bubble in a stream or a shadow or a drop of dew in the morning sun or a flash of lightning. And everything is transient in the midst of this transiency. And flowing from the original nature, one is not deceived by the passing illusions of the world. So the training, which is I described in all of the previous stages of the ox herding picture, is no longer required. So we just continue to refine ourselves, even though, so, though it says everybody's the Buddha, we have to keep refining ourselves to fully realize what that means. And there's a, a Zen saying which uh, uh, goes like this, the rippling voice of the brook in the valley <clears throat> speaks the truth continually and penetratingly. The green mountain is none other than the body of purity. So wherever we go, whatever we see, whatever we hear right there, is a body of purity and the sound of truth and wisdom. And that's what it means when we say mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. So the mountains and the rivers are aspects of the true origin. And um, the mountain rises high, it does not hinder the passage of the clouds. And although the bamboo grows thick, it does not stop the stream from flowing. So each being has always lived in the place of its nature. I think Dogen, Dogen said that uh, each creature never fails to completely cover the ground. It's kind of an interesting expression, isn't it? What does that mean? That everything is complete and whole as it is. Yeah. Even, even an ant. Yeah. An ant covers the whole ground. So that means that huh? an ant couldn't be any more of an ant than it is. <laughs> and so what do we, how do we apply that to ourselves? Hmm? So that's one of the biggest problems that we have <clears throat> in general, being humans and having a, a psychological component, emotional component. We think that we're not complete. You know, somewhere in our life when we were young, somebody may have told you that good boys don't behave like that or good girls don't behave like that or you're going to amount to nothing. <laughs> and then there's a part of us that becomes in our unconscious mind. And it's still affecting us. So. But... No creature ever fails to completely cover the ground. So what are we lacking? Well, we have an idea that I'm not lovable or I'm not good enough or something. And we believe it. You know? That's what my teacher used to say over and over and over again, to appreciate yourself, appreciate yourself. In fact, there is one big book is called entitled Appreciate Your Life. Yeah. So what prevents us from doing that? Because I like vanilla. That's what prevents us from doing that. <laughs> so this is a state of just this. Until you reach this state, don't talk of just this. When you realize just this, you'll know it's nothing special. So there's no need to be arrogant and self-aggrandizing. 
There is a poem that was uh, written about this stage. <clears throat> it goes like this. Return to the ground in origin. Returning to the ground in origin, the herdsman has completed everything. Nothing is better than to be blind and deaf. He sits in his hut and does not see anything outside. Boundlessly flows the river just as it flows. Red blooms the flower just as it blooms. So <clears throat> nothing's better than be blind or deaf. It uh, sounds kind of strange. But, you know, we chanted this morning the Heart Sutra, where it said, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, you know, no object of sight, sound, taste, touch. So what does that mean? See? It means that you are so attuned to your seeing and your hearing that there's no person hearing and seeing. And when you see something, you're so identified with it, it's not separate. So we call that <clears throat> no seeing, no hearing. We call it blind and deaf. So... It means a state of mind where there's nothing to see and nothing to hear. When you see, there's only seeing. And then the seeing disappears. And when you hear, you only hear. And the subject that hears disappears. And the sound that you hear disappears. It just becomes one. But even calling it one is defining it. It just is. because everything is empty. It just arises at that moment. But understanding the logic of this is not sufficient. I mean, a certain kind of logic, it makes sense. You know, it doesn't make sense in, in the logic that we mostly are exposed to in our schools here. But when you realize this as a fact for you, then you become like a blind and deaf person. So the next line says he sits in his hut and does not see anything outside. And uh, uh, there's in a commentary by uh, Yamada Cohen Roshi, he says this dialogue comes from, uh, this comes from a dialogue between Uman and, and Master Kempo in the ninth and 10th century. And Uman visited Kempo and asked, why doesn't a person <coughs> inside the hermitage know anything outside the hermitage? And uh, at this, Kempo burst out into laughter. <coughs> so... <coughs> The point is that um, the person inside the hermitage or the subject cannot see things in front of the hermitage or the objects. So that's what um, <coughs> Dogen says. He says to study Zen is to study the self. And then the next line is to study the self is to forget the self. Mm -hmm. To forget the self means that you realize when you really look and say, what is this self? Look at it very hard. You can't grasp it. He says, forget it. There is no self. You can't grasp it. So that's why the person inside the subject, inside the hermitage, can't see things because the subject, there's no self. 
But he goes on and he says, to forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. In other words, if you forget the self, everything in your life is the enlightened life because you're not constantly filtering it, analyzing it, projecting on it. So every day is a good day, even when you're having difficulties. And he said to be enlightened by everything, or he actually says by the 10,000 dharmas, which means all phenomena, is to drop away one's body and mind and those of others. In other words, to let go of the attachment to self, which includes mind and body, and also see to let go of the attachment to the body and mind of others. And that's what it says here, that that he sits inside his hut and does not see anything outside. So that's because there isn't anything in front of him. See, we just create a certain reality. But he says in actual truth, the subject doesn't exist either. Not only is there no object, but there's no subject. So this is a pretty, this is stage nine. It's a pretty advanced stage. <laughs> So how do you function? <laughs> if I didn't exist and you don't exist, how do we function? So the next line says, boundlessly flows the river just as it flows. And red blooms the flower just as it blooms. So, so every, you know, there's still green willows and red flowers and, and everybody has their own path. You know, in searching for the ox, their true self, gave him, created all kinds of unnecessary trouble. So, you function naturally. So when a, when a person has achieved this great awakening, their appearance does not change. There's not a, if, um, <clears throat> so you can't say this yes in imitation, but only after long and unnecessary effort and after the return to the origin. But it's not our Zen practice to remain in the, an empty state, to remain suspended, where one sees no beings, hears no voices, where there's neither Buddhas nor devils. One must enter the town where one at the same time sees and does not see and vice versa. So there's only one eye, seeing and not seeing it vanished. So if he sits in his hut and doesn't see anything outside it, all beings are just as they are. Turning from the nature to the presence of things occurs, which is the crux of truth of as it is. So a commentary on this says, now you're back to your starting point. How much effort you needed for that? Occasionally you encourage yourself or you sank into desperation. You kept sitting in defiance of the pain in your legs or of unbearable fatigue. And many times you said, now I've come to a true experience. But soon that experience is covered with uh, disillusionment, doubt. 
you often felt in desperation in this long journey? So ultimately, the source of the energy, which need not be sought, is there. It is you who are rich, rather than being enriched by something else. Because there's uh, basic warmth as well as basic space, the Buddha activity of compassion <laughs> is alive. Yeah. And so... Whatever we say, whatever we do, you know, that's an expression of it. So. so remember last time we talked about uh, how disgraceful it was to be uh, honored by by birds dropping flowers on, on the uh, on the guru, you know. So as long as he was projecting this. Uh, brilliance and sagacity and you know the birds were recognizing but after he became enlightened they no longer saw him because <laughs> he let go of all of that shiny veneer and that's what this is it's just to be yourself without anything extra and i'll say this again and i've said it before many many times is that when the Buddha was asked what he gained through all of his meditation and his practice, and he said, I've gained nothing, but I've let go of many things. And that's what our practice is. You know, unfortunately, we have to make an effort in order to experience effortlessness. And what is the effort that we make? Somebody asked me this morning, I think, and, the, and I've reflected on this a lot. And uh, what I've come up with is that the best effort we can make is to let go of whatever is extra, whatever we don't need. Yeah. And that's just about everything. You know, we just keep letting go, letting go. What are we attached to? What are we holding on to? What are these opinions? You know, my uh, one of my my. Older Dharma brother and mentor Bernie Glassman used to say, it's just your opinion, man. But you know where he got that? I just saw a, a, a clip from the Big Lebowski on, on the, at the internet. And then, uh, of course, uh, Jeff Bridges played the Big Lebowski. And Bernie and Jeff wrote this book together called The Dude and the Zen Master. And uh, Bernie took a lot of the dialogue out of the Big Lebowski and said, those are Zen koans, you know. And one of them that Bernie uh, adopted in his own teaching was, it's just your opinion, man. It's just your opinion. I mean, he, he even, Bernie went so far as to even talk about the Ten Noble Truths. Or, uh, or the Four Noble Truths, excuse me, the Four Noble Truths. And he said, they should be the Four Noble Opinions, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, but if you look at it, what is it, what is it that we're holding on to? So, so I'll leave it there. And,